so glad that you're with us today and would like to begin by um, asking the question if you believe that there is a divine idea for this thing called life. That if you believe, as our founder said, that there is a divine destiny for this thing called life. And for me, when I think about the intrinsic magnificence, be it in nature or in the brilliance of the human genome or in the the virtues we collectively share and rise in in times of challenge, it's hard for me to give any answer but yes to that question. There is a divine idea for this thing called life. And I would say that not only is life a divine idea of God, but that God is the divine idea in all that is life. I love how it's said in the Psalms. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So another question for you today is, do you believe that there is a divine idea for every life? That there is a divine idea present for every life? Now you may stop and look around and say, this person looks like they're embodying the divine idea better than someone else, or the divine idea may have been lost on that person. But I think it's always there. There's an old saying that I love, that you can count the seeds in an apple, but you can't count the apples in a seed. There is a divine potentiality in all of our lives, and you never know what circumstance may come about to help bring forth those apples, those divine fruits that help us all to grow. When I was 15 years old, I received my first ever invitation to share with a religious science congregation. I was called by the minister of the Escondido Church of Religious Science outside of San Diego, um, by the minister there at the time, Mr. Lloyd Barrett, uh, who many of you know because he served later here at Mile High Church. And what a weird opportunity, I'd never thought about it. And someone who was a spiritual father to me, Alan Feldman, drove me the hour and a half there to Escondido and I got up and I hardly remember what I talked about, but it was over and they were nice to me. And somehow, Lloyd, someone I didn't even know, nurtured this seed that would eventually grow to be, in some ways, the center of my professional life. You never know the seeds the fruits in each of us that can be polished, that can be nurtured to grow and to deepen. So one more question for you. Do you believe that there is a divine idea for your life? Do you believe there is a divine idea for your life? I don't just mean as a whole, but a divine idea for your relationships. A divine idea for your work in the world, a divine idea for your self-care, a divine idea for your relationship with this divine power that we call life, that is wanting to work its way in through and as you in your experience. See, it's one thing to say there's a power for good greater than we are in the universe, but it's another thing to say that this power, this presence, it knows you. It believes in you. It knows every hair on your head or lack thereof. It knows every breath you breathe. It knows the inward nature. Not only your divine secrets, but your divine plan. And when we open our hearts, it speaks to us like a holy father. You are my precious child. I love you. I believe in you. Let us walk together in this journey and always remember, I'm always here. This divine idea, which again for me isn't just God's divine idea for us, but God is these divine ideas in and as us. They're like building blocks for our lives. Each of us can build our lives with divine ideas. I love how our founder, Ernest Holmes, put it. He said, we must know that the doorway of opportunity is never closed. Man is always receptive to the divine ideas. 
It is never too late for you to manifest opportunity. It is never withheld from you for a single moment. There is no sense of limited or restricted opportunity. I don't know about you, but I've spent way too much time in my life building my life with bad ideas. I've built relationships on the foundation of feeling not enough and on fears of abandonment. I've built works and semi-careers on uh, the need to try to make myself indispensable, therefore burning myself out. I've built self-care on foundations of not feeling good enough and self-rejection. And I've built spirituality at times in my life and a God that I hoped was there but didn't think I was worthy enough to receive. For many of us, we can't build our life brand new with new ideas, but we can do a lot of remodeling. And so I want to talk about what it means this morning to build your life with divine ideas. And I have four to share with you today. The first divine idea to build your life with is deep meaning. Build your life with deeper meaning. Sometimes when we think of meaning, we think of it in a very existential way. What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of my life? What the hell is going on here? The kind of meaning I'm talking about is the simplest thing. It's about taking each moment of your life and allowing it to have significance, allowing it to have intentionality, allowing yourself and where you are, the places that you reside in, to have significance and purpose. Do you remember when you first got your own room? When it, when it really belonged to you and it was for yours to do whatever you could do with? Mine was a half room because I shared it with my brother. But the intentionality, you know, I could choose any poster that I wanted to put on the wall. You know, what altar would I create with my He-Man action figures? And where would I put the bed? Would I put it in the center of the room? Would I put it up against the window? All of these were choices to me at the time of significant importance. And would the center of my room be a, a cheap television set that I could try and stay up Saturday Night Live uh, and, and watch Saturday Night Live with? Or would it be a stereo, a record player, so that the room was filled with music? Luckily, my brother had the stereo and I had the TV set, although he was older than me, so I don't know how much music I got to listen to on the stereo, and I think he got to watch a lot of TV on my television set. But remember that sense of intentionality and to build your life with divine ideas. Try using the divine building block of deeper meaning. Look at the spaces that you reside in, be it at home or in your car or in your workplace, and how can I add more symbols of significance? Look around your home, many of you are watching from home right now, and what is the purpose of each space in my household? You can declare it right now. This kitchen table is a space for sacred conversations. This porch is a space for sacred silence or sacred laughter. This bed, I declare, is a space for sacred rest. When we bring this intentionality, the meaning of life, God as the divine idea of deeper meaning reveals itself. A second divine building block to build your life with. Unconditioned joy. Unconditioned joy. There's that joy that comes from pleasure of the senses. There's that pain that comes from sorrow and it's almost like they're they're two sides of the same pole so that joy on that side of the pole isn't the kind of joy that I'm talking about when I say unconditioned joy the joy that I'm talking about is the joy of life itself it's the joy of knowing you're alive it's the joy even in the midst of frustration of wondering what all this is for that says I am a miracle because life is. When we can learn to live from that unconditioned joy, we can say, this thing going on in my life, I'm not grateful for. But this whole of my life, I am so grateful for. I've had two great teachers 
of unconditioned joy in my life. They're my children, and we have pictures to share of them today and just want to honor them. There's Gavin, and there's Nancy June, and they've been such incredible teachers to me of what unconditioned joy means. I think of my daughter, Nancy, and one of the great lessons she's taught me is don't be afraid to say hello to people. We're so awkward about giving people space, and the reason we can't bring Nancy June back to a restaurant yet is she insists on greeting every table. There's something about living from that joy of life within, transcendent of conditions, that can create immense creativity in our lives. All we need to do to begin to allow this unconditioned joy is to go to one of those spaces that you've declared as sacred for yourself and give yourself a simple pleasure. A cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a good book. Take a little stroll in nature and it reveals itself. Ah, there it is. There's that unconditioned joy. And I promise you, When you live from that unconditioned joy, it is one of the most creative, powerful things that you can do in your life. It can show up in so many ways. I love how a mentor of mine, a great religious science minister by the name of Linda McNamara put it. She said, some people say we should live life as if it is our last day on earth. Maybe we should live as if it is our first day on earth. Conscious, awake, aware of the beauty and bounty around us, being childlike in our wonder. Or Betty Smith put it this way, look at everything always as though you were seeing it either for the first or last time. Thus is your time on earth filled with glory. A third divine building block I'm calling creative trust. What does it mean to live your life in creative trust? Any of us folk who consider ourselves spiritual at some point have to confront the idea that our life is a reflection of our relationship with God. That our life is a manifestation of what God and ourselves have done in co-creating our life together. And thus, as important as trust is in all of our relationships, and I would say it's the most creative element to building successful relationships, successful work, and successful living. But this trust must begin with our sense of the sacred. For many of us, our understanding of God begins as a stranger, someone someone else knows that we're often afraid of, intimidated by. Then God may become uh, an acquaintance, something we experience once in a while that we know might be out there watching us or thinking about us. Then we go steady with God. We see what it's like to live in a closeness with the divine. But we question it, is this thing for real? Is this really there? And then the time comes where we've got to put a ring on it, where we have to solidify our belief in God, and the harder part of that, God's belief in us, that divine idea implanted in our soul in a primordial time, ready to come alive, right here and right now. It's so powerful to say God and I are one, but there's a certain power in the spirit of relationship to say that God and I are so close that you couldn't fit a sheet of paper between us that the divine and I are are so close that the beating of my heart and the breathing of my, my breath are a part of being and rhythm with its divine power. Can you feel that closeness with God? God so close with you that you can feel tickles coming up your spine, that you can feel bumps starting on your arms, that your hair starts to lift up in some way to feel so close with this divine presence, to know that you can trust it as it believes in you, to co-create your life with these divine ideas. This doesn't mean test God. This doesn't mean tempt God. It means test yourself. Be willing, no matter how comfortable mediocrity may seem, to be committed to growth 
committed to new understandings of love, to new understandings of what it means to live creatively, courageously, spontaneously. In honor of Father's Day today, I wanted to share part of a letter that was written by a gentleman named Bud Wilkinson, who is a longtime coach at Oklahoma University, Boomer Sumer, to his son, Jay. Jay was an aspiring football player and always wanted to play for his dad, but things worked out where he was called to go to Duke University instead. And it was very challenging for him. And so Bud wrote many letters that you can find, but the most famous is his first one, and I'd like to share a portion of it today. When any person leaves a pleasant situation to enter the unknown, there was always the realization of how nice, good, and comfortable things were before. Yet only by facing the future and accepting new and progressively more difficult challenges are we able to grow, develop, and avoid stagnation. You have more total all-around ability in all fields than anyone I have ever known. You will certainly be a great man and make a great contribution to the world. But to do this, you must take on new and progressively more difficult challenges. Always remember that I believe in you no matter what. You must do what seems right to you. Don't be swayed by what other people think. My grandmother, a great lady, one of the finest I've ever known, She always told me when I was a young boy growing up, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. It is the best advice one can have for happy, successful living. And he closes by saying, I love you, Jay, more than anything in life. Don't worry about things. Live each day by doing your best. We'll look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Love always, Dad. And we can read those words as touching words from a father to his son. But we could also view those words from the father presences in our own life to ourselves. And that divine parent, that divine holy presence, which doesn't promise us what will occur in the future, but tells us we have everything we need within us to be all that we came here to be. Creative trust. Alas, divine building block to discuss with you today is tenacious love. Love tenaciously. Realize that when love isn't at the center of your life and telling the people that you care about and being there for them isn't the the essential part of your day, that we've lost a step in terms of living in alignment with what we're really here for and what life is really all about. Another great lesson that Nancy June has taught me. My baby girls, when she comes downstairs, her her first concern is her stuffed animals. (laughs) She goes around and picks one up, gives it pats, calls its name, and she's a better spiritual teacher than I am because in that she's reminding me that, yes, for me, I might need a cup of coffee and some meditation first, but if my focus isn't loving the people that I love the most on a regular basis, I'm out of alignment with that divine fruit that wants to come forward in those relationships. So question, and this could be a fun and imaginative one, who is the most tenacious lover you've ever known or known of? Who's the most tenacious lover? Besides Mrs. Reeves, I think of uh, a certain gentleman, we'll put up his picture here, Mahatma Gandhi. Now, doesn't he look like a tenacious lover to you? But when I think of someone who truly lives in the spirit of tenacious love, I think of this man who, as a young man, became an attorney and found himself thrown off a train because the color of his skin. And it so offended his soul. It so challenged his spirit that he began to recreate and rebuild his life with divine ideas. He began to read the teachings of Christians in the words of Jesus. He began to discover his own roots, which he had denied as a young man, his Hindu roots, his Indian's teachings. He picked up a little book called Civil Disobedience by Henry David Thoreau, and he put all of this together to coin a term he called satragraha, soul force, truth force, love force. 
And he argued that this love, this power, was more tenacious and powerful energy of change than anything that has ever been created. And that it was something that we should apply not only to the people that we care about, but the people that we might dislike, who discriminate against us, or bully us, or challenge us. He would share, it is no nonviolence if we merely love those who love us. It is nonviolence only when we love those who hate us. I know how difficult it is to follow this grand law of love, but are not all great and good things difficult to do? Love of the hater is the most difficult of all, but even the grace of God, even this most difficult thing becomes easy to accomplish if we want to do it. Gandhi walked his talk, even writing a a letter appealing to Adolf Hitler before the war really got bad in the late 1930s. Gandhi would teach us that anger is an important and powerful emotion. If you don't feel it and acknowledge it, it can act out in all sorts of ways. But expressed towards those we disagree with, with rage, it only tears down. It can never lift up. He taught us that fear is a valid and important emotion, nothing to be afraid of that we have to honor and recognize when we feel afraid. But fear expressed is a kind of inaction that keeps us silent, complicit, repressed. It is not a creative building block, but love. When we accept it in ourselves, not just as soft and warm and flowery, but empowering and creative, when we apply that to our lives, It is the most creative building block that there is. Apply what it means to love strongly and boldly in the challenges before us in the world and in our country. Apply this love boldly for family members or people who were once close to you, who you may now be estranged from or in deep disagreement with. And most importantly, apply this tenacious love to yourself, to your own body, to your own heart, to your own beliefs. Love yourself on to the altar of the divine's love for you. Realize that the divine doesn't just represent the best of all of us, but that you represent the best of what the divine is and what it can become.